Welcome back to the next section in our Organizing 101 series. This portion is also drawing from Jane McAlevey's No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age. We will be examining portions of that book, some of Jane's other work, and I will also be going through organizing manuals, workshops, trainings, uh, different exercises people can use, uh, and the different ways they've been used, uh, in my experience, and through history. Today we are talking about the difference between advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing. Three fundamentally different approaches, in some ways, in some contexts, complementary to each other, but not always. In my opinion, my friends, this is by far the most important audio clip I have recorded thus far. So, take a second, put down whatever you're doing, and please listen up, because if you are interested in making political change, these are the sort of things that I wish someone would have explained to me 15 years ago. If, in fact, someone would have explained these things to me, and, you know, this gets a part of what we'll talk about today. Because I joined a left that was on the ropes, I joined a left that was barely existent in 2006. And as a result, the left had no institutions. And because the left had no institutions, there was no way to systematically educate new organizers. Why? Because everyone was stuck in the mobilizing approach. Why? Because people had taken that approach for the last 45 years. And as a result, The left had very little to show for it except for exceedingly uh, catastrophic right-wing victories across the board, something I wrote about in a recent piece for Counterpunch called Left-Wing Pokemon. Um, Today we're talking again about the fundamental differences between advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing. Each approach will produce different results. McAlevey argues that progressive movements have experienced 45-plus years of failure because they have shifted from an organizing approach to a mobilizing approach. In other words, this is a key reason, if not one of the reasons or the reason why we are getting our asses kicked constantly by right-wing political forces. Now, there's a million other factors that play into why the left is as weak and disempowered and fragmented as it is today, but those things, like, you know, COINTELPRO or... Uh, violence versus nonviolence or the fragmentation of SDS and the Black Panthers and the FBI and so on and so forth. These are all things that we cannot control. The most important part of McAlevey's work, in my opinion, is that she focuses on what organizers should focus on, and that is what we can control. So only think about the things we can control. I'll use one more example before we get into a description of the differences of these approaches to politics. The Bernie Sanders campaign is the prime example of too many people in the United States processing politics as pundits and as commentators and as analysts instead of as organizers. So during the primaries, people would say things like, oh, the reason Bernie lost was because he didn't say X, Y, or Z during the debate, or Obama consolidated power in the primaries, and that's why Bernie lost. Well, maybe those things are true to some degree. We have absolutely no control over them. And if you're getting into politics, you should fully expect that the people with power and money will do everything they can to stop progressive political projects, campaigns, candidates, etc. So if you're going into this work, expect that you're going to meet a lot of resistance from people who have power and privilege in this society. They don't want to, and they're not going to give it up easily. Okay, so again, as organizers, what are we focused on in the Bernie campaign? How could we have organized better? Who could we have organized better? At what times? Through what projects? Those are the things that organizers think about. Those are the things that people who are serious about politics think about if they want to make a change. If we're interested in just examining the world, then focus on all of the things that we don't have power on, but you're not organizing, you're analyzing. Okay, advocacy. And well, Advocacy is the first approach and the lowest approach to political involvement. Advocacy doesn't involve ordinary people in any real way. Lawyers, pollsters, researchers, and communications firms 
are engaged to wage the battle. You see this also in a lot of electoral efforts, though McLevy is not talking about uh, electoral efforts in her writings in No Shortcuts. What we've seen is a lot of electoral efforts uh, morph into this advocacy approach where lawyers and pollsters and researchers and communications firms are the primary components to an electoral campaign. I think it's important to note that. Uh, We saw that a lot in the last few cycles, and it continues to grow. Though effective for forcing car companies, say, to install seatbelts, so here we're thinking about Ralph Nader. What was Ralph Nader doing? Ralph Nader was engaging in advocacy. Ralph Nader was not mobilizing massive numbers of people, something we'll get to, and he definitely wasn't uh, organizing. Uh, Does that mean that having seatbelts or banishing toys with components that infants might choke on is a bad thing? No, Um, but this strategy of advocacy severely limits serious challenges to elite power. In other words, it's not as if Ralph Nader really took on uh, the car companies uh, to change their practices in any real way that would benefit massive numbers of ordinary people. Uh, at the workplace. Yes, we benefited from having seatbelts. Yes, the amount of deaths went down. But the relationship between the bosses at the car companies, the people who own the car companies, and the people who are buying and using vehicles did not change whatsoever through that advocacy approach. Advocacy fails to use the only concrete advantage ordinary people have over elites. I'll say that again. Advocacy fails to use the only concrete advantage ordinary people have over elites, and that's large numbers. In workplace strikes, at the ballot box, or in nonviolent civil disobedience, strategically deployed masses have long been unique weapon of ordinary people. The 1% have a vast armory of material resources and political special forces, but the 99% have an army. It is the one factor that distinguishes us from the people in power. So if your political project does not rely, or, or your theory of power or how to get it, does not include bringing massive numbers of ordinary people into the mix, uh, you are not organizing, number one. And number two, you are not using the only concrete advantage we have over elites, and that's our numbers. Under advocacy, under the advocacy approach, the theory of power is an elite theory of power. Advocacy groups tend to seek one-time wins or narrow policy changes, often through courts or backroom negotiations that do not permanently alter the relations of power. Over the past 40 years, a newer mechanism of change seekers has sort of reached, uh, and that's, you know, the organizing or the mobilizing approach, I'm sorry. But just to be clear here, Each approach, advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing, has a theory of power, a strategy, and a people focus. Okay, so the theory of power for elites is an elite, or for advocacy, I'm sorry, is an elite theory of power. This is the idea that the system is never going to fundamentally change, so why even bother? Let's just get some good paid consultants, sharp, Ivy League educated lawyers, and let's take these corporations to court and see if we could get some reforms Uh, That might make a menial difference in people's lives, uh, might make no difference in people's lives, but ordinary people are not central to that process. And in fact, under the advocacy approach, the strategy under the advocacy approach is uh, largely leans on litigation. So there's heavy spending on polling, advertising, and other paid media. We see this in electoral efforts. But in non-electoral efforts, the strategy is almost solely litigation. Uh, The people focus, there's virtually none. Over the last 40 years, though, a newer mechanism for change seekers has proliferated, the mobilizing approach. Mobilizing is a substantial improvement over advocacy. Let me say that again. Mobilizing is a substantial improvement over advocacy because it does bring large numbers of people to the fight. However, too often they are the same people. So yes, big mobilizations bringing tons of people out. The only problem, they're the same people we've seen over and over again. Dedicated activists who show up over and over at every meeting and rally for all the good causes, but without full mass of their coworkers or community behind them. So let me inject a little bit of personal experience here. I'm thinking of many, many, many political 
efforts that I've been engaged with over the years that fall into this category. Virtually, in fact, I would say every single political effort that I've been engaged with until we opened politics, art, roots, culture, the community cultural center that exists here in Michigan City, and until we started working with a local organization called Our MC, Organized and United Residents of Michigan City, every sing, every single thing I've been involved with and everything before that had been an mobilizing effort. It was never an organizing effort. The anti-war movement was a mobilizing effort. Occupy Wall Street was a mobilizing effort. Environmental campaigns I had been on were mobilizing efforts. Madison, Wisconsin uprisings were mobilizing efforts. The Black Lives Matter protests uh, were mobilizing efforts. Uh, a, a brief foray into uh, what certain parts of organizing, like we were drawing from some of that not knowing with some local campaigns. There was a couple campaigns to stop prisons uh, to the west of us here in northwest Indiana and also on the border with Illinois. There was a school board campaign. Uh, there were some local efforts. There were like some things going on where people were dabbling in what we would call organizing, but largely we were mobilizing. Uh, and including, of course, I would argue the Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016 and 2020. Those were mobilizing efforts. We were bringing people to our side who already agreed with us. This was shown even more clearly the second time Bernie ran. Um, we were unable to bring large segments of not just people who don't agree with us, which is central to the concept of organizing. We were unable to bring people who did agree with us. Poll after poll in the primary showed that Democratic voters actually supported Bernie Sanders' policies more than Joe Biden's, yet they still voted for Joe Biden. Why? Because people weren't organized in the four years from 2016 to 2020, hence unable uh, to gain a credible, reliable, accountable base of supporters who they knew would vote the right way. So everything I had been involved with prior to 2016, for the most part, you know, 95% of those efforts were mobilizing efforts. And never once did I have the mass of my coworkers or my community behind me. I would go to anti-war events throughout the Bush era and the Obama era, big mobilizations, Occupy, Madison, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter, environmental uh, Standing Rock was another mobilization that we participated in. And never once did I come back to a workplace or a community where the mass numbers of my coworkers or fellow community members supported those efforts, not one time, let alone be engaged in them. So this is because, in part, uh, a professional staff directs, manipulates, and controls the mobilization. Now, we saw this throughout the anti-war movement when I was a member of Iraq Veterans Against the War, as an incoming new member who had never been participated in left-wing political actions, I had no fucking clue what was going on. I mean, really had no clue. Uh, was just a working-class cat, barely graduated high school, so on and so forth. I don't need to get into all that. But it wasn't like I, you know, wasn't some brainchild. I definitely wasn't particularly smart. Uh, I wasn't, uh, you know, well-educated on these topics. And I didn't come from a family of political organizers. Uh, so I had no idea but I did see quickly that a professional staff was directing, manipulating, and controlling the mobilizations. Even when we would go through workshops and conferences that were supposed to be sort of like strategy retreats, it was, also, it was always kind of known that the people who had set up that event already knew what they wanted. And the rest of us were just kind of like plugging in data and like giving our two cents. And they were kind of making us feel like our opinions were being heard, but in reality, they knew what the fuck they wanted to get out of that event anyway. Um, that's part of the problem with, with this, and that, that's because you have a professional staff uh, directing. And of course, this is the case for most nonprofit organizations. All, virtually every nonprofit organization falls into the category of advocacy or mobilizing. Uh, there's no nonprofit that I know of unless it exists at a very small scale that's doing actual organizing work. Uh, that, that just, in, by design, it can't happen. Um, the staffers in the mobilizing approach see themselves, not ordinary people, as the key agents of change. To them, it matters little who shows up or why as long as sufficient numbers of bodies appear enough for a, a good photo op or enough for a tweet that might generate earned media, uh, which then can turn into more 
uh, members, which then can turn into more donors, again, playing the NGO game. The committed activists in the photo have had no part in developing a power analysis. We see this all the time. Sierra Club, 350.org, name the NGO, and, you know, this has happened verbatim. The committed activists in the photo, of course, had no part in developing a power analysis. They aren't informed about that or the resulting strategy, but they have dutifully showed up at protests that rarely matter to power holders. The theory of power under the mobilizing approach is primarily elite. Again, there's no sense that we're going to fundamentally change society, just that we could kind of pressure the people who are in power to do better things. Staff or activists in the theory of power under the mobilizing approach set goals with low to medium concession costs or, more typically, set an ambitious goal and declare a win even when the win has no or only weak enforcement provisions. In other words, a lot of times you'll see these NGOs sort of set really low goals, you know, low concession costs for those in power. So you might say something like, can we get the state government to put windmills on the National Guard bases? You know, <laughs> can we get uh, the steel mill to stop dumping highly toxic uh, chemicals into the lake? Something they should have been doing anyway, like things like this, you know, or can we get uh, higher emissions for uh, gas guzzling vehicles and things like this? The, the, things that aren't going to fundamentally change society, things that are definitely not going to uh, make a real material difference in people's lives. And that's a big part of this as well. You know, because the other part of what Mac Levy is saying, and I agree, I've seen this actually more so than the than the former. I haven't seen too often uh, groups sort of shoot for low concession costs, though I over the years have seen it more and more. More typically what I see, and she mentions this, is that a lot of these NGOs and a lot of people who mobilize set ambitious goals and then declare a win even when there is no real win or when there's like a weak win. You know, so when it's something really small that people don't see as a huge victory, yet the professional staff and so on, they try and drum it up as, oh, we did this big thing, stay motivated, guys, stay engaged. Well, their jobs depend on it. Of course they want to keep you engaged. <laughs> if you're not engaged, if there's not people donating to their NGO, uh, they're screwed. Uh, they can't make any money. It's what their careers lie on, rely on. Uh, so they have to play that game. Once you're in the NGO, once you're mobilizing... You can't do anything else. Your livelihood quite literally depends on you continuing to mobilize the same people, hoping to get a few more donors or hoping to maintain those big donors that are keeping the whole project going or to make sure you can give the people who are, uh, you know, send the people who are giving you grant money, uh, fancy photos and write-ups about all this amazing work that we're doing. You know, I've been, been there, done that. Uh, it's a burnout. It's a straight road to burnout and or cynicism uh, that's really unhelpful. And to be quite honest with you, if I would have stayed down the path of mobilizing for much longer working with these national NGOs, uh, I would have quit doing left-wing politics. I, well, I either would have turned into a right-wing maniac or I would have quit doing politics entirely. So under the mobilizing approach, the theory of power, again, is primarily elite Staffer activists set goals with low to medium concession costs or more typically set an ambitious goal and declare a win even when the win has no or only weak enforcement provisions. Backroom secret deal making by paid professionals is common. And we've seen this all the time. Anyone who's been engaged with a large NGO has seen that. The strategy? Campaigns. Campaigns run by professional staff or volunteer activists with no base of actual measurable supporters. Let me say that again. Under the mobilizing approach, campaigns are run by professional staff or volunteer activists. Again, volunteer activists. These are people who already agree with us with no base of actual, no actual base, no measurable supporters that prior, you know, and what will usually happen in this strategy under mobilizing uh, is that uh, activists will prioritize framing, frames and messaging over actual base power. It's all about, if you hear someone talking about frames and messaging and narratives before you hear them talk about power, walk the other way. Because they're about to fuck you over and they're about to waste your time. And I'm sorry, but if you're going to get engaged with politics in 2021, don't waste your time. 
do it in a serious way and do it with people who are serious, who have an idea what the fuck they're trying to accomplish. Do not waste your time with people who talk about framing and messaging and narratives over building bases of power. Power is the key. Uh, on an aside, what I'll say is if you're talking to someone about politics who calls themselves an activist or an organizer and they don't use the term power in the first two sentences that you're talking to them, your spidey senses should immediately go up. So the strategy under the mobilizing approach, again, campaigns run by professional staff or volunteer activists, no measurable supporters, no real base of supporters who are accountable and engaged, uh, especially engaged in the actual process of developing the strategy for the campaign. Uh, These people prioritize framing and messaging over actually building a base of power. Staff selected authentic messengers represent the constituency to the media and policymakers. I saw this happen over and over again with the Fight for 15 campaign back in 2013 and 2014, where SEIU and professional paid organizers, uh, professional staff, uh, were setting up these big events and pulling these poor workers out of their McDonald's or Burger King And then having them get on a camera and talk about how horrific their lives are and talk about how they're organizing and they're building power when in reality it was a paid staff behind the scene. And this poor cat, you know, woman or man, you know, poor person who's forced to stand up at this podium and has real no, really no say so in how things are going to go. The entire fight for 15 campaign was a mobilizing slash advocacy effort to the bone. Um, it has done nothing to change power relations between workers and bosses. Uh, and, you know, eight years later, we're just now passing it as uh, federal legislation. And that has little to do with uh, objective conditions, more so than it has to do with the approach that the Fight for 15 activists and organizers took from the get-go. And that was a mobilizing approach, which uh, really hindered their ability to make changes uh, in a fundamental way. Uh, that people would notice again by the time fight for by the time the fucking minimum wage is fifteen dollars an hour. Uh, let me tell you, you know, people, <laughs> most people I know are going to be right back where they were five years ago. Um, yes, there's gains to you know. I don't want to downplay that too much, but let's get serious. And, and you know, the people who I think are looking for any reason to look for something positive are doing everyone a really big disservice by not being critical of this. Uh, The fact that we're going to have to wait till 2025 to get this $15 an hour is beyond absurd. Um, But that's maybe a conversation for another day. What I will say is that because the Fight for 15 campaign focused so much on advocacy and mobilizing, you know, they were never able to really build uh, a a real deep base of organized, you know, fast food workers. And we see that today. There's hardly any movement, hardly any mobilization, hardly any efforts taking place uh, in fast food industry at all, really. And there hasn't been for years. The people focus under the, oh, one more thing about strategy under the mobilizing approach. Ordinary people have very little say in strategy or running the actual campaign. Uh, and again, that was clear with fight for 15. It was clear in my time with Iraq veterans against the war. It was clear at standing rock. It was clear with black lives matter, so on and so forth. The people focus under the mobilizing approach is grassroots activists people already committed to the cause who show up over and over again. And then when they eventually and inevitably burn out, new also previously committed activists are recruited and so on. Social media is overly relied on. Does that sound familiar? It should because that makes up about 99% of the left in the United States, or at least people who call themselves left. The third approach, organizing, places the agency for success with a continually expanding base of ordinary people. The agency for success is solely with a continually expanding base of ordinary people. A mass of people never previously involved who don't consider themselves activists at all. That's the point of organizing. In the organizing approach, specific injustice and outrage are the immediate motivation, but the primary goal is to transfer power from the elite to the majority, from the 1% to the 99%. Individual campaigns matter in themselves, but they are primarily a mechanism for bringing new people into the process and keeping them involved. The organizing approach relies on mass negotiations to win. 
rather than the closed-door deal-making typical of both advocacy and mobilizing. Ordinary people help make the power analysis, they help design the strategy, and they are central to achieving the outcome. They are essential, and they know it. Let me say that again. The organizing approach relies on mass negotiations to win. Rather than closed-door deal-making typical of both advocacy and mobilizing, Ordinary people help make the power analysis. That means ordinary people are central to the part of making the power analysis. Do they understand what the hell we're doing and do they understand what they're up against? Do they understand what power that they have? Ordinary people are central to designing the strategy. So it's not just do they understand what's going on, but do they understand it enough to develop then a strategy for taking on those power structures? And then on top of that, Ordinary people are central to achieve the outcome. So it's not that paid staff or mobilizers or people who already agree with us or lawyers are going to take care of the issue for us. The ordinary people are going to take care of it. They're the ones who are going to be central to achieving the outcome, whether that's through however it is to raise the political, social, economic costs for the elites, nonviolent civil disobedience, workplace strikes, uh, electoral campaigns, so on and so forth. The theory of power under the organizing approach is mass inclusive and collective organizing groups transform the power structure to favor ordinary people and diminish the power of their opposition specific campaigns fit into a larger power building strategy they prioritize power analysis involving ordinary people in it and decipher the often hidden relationship between economic social and political power. Settlement typically comes from mass negotiations with large numbers involved. That's the theory of power under organizing. The strategy under organizing. Recruitment and involvement of specific, large numbers of people, specific and large numbers of people whose power is derived from their ability to withdraw labor or other cooperation from those who rely on them. Majority strikes, sustained and strategic nonviolent direct action, electoral majorities. That's what we're talking about. Majority strikes, that means 90 to 95% of people in your workplace are ready to strike. No debate there. McLevy is very clear. Sustained and strategic nonviolent direct action. The left in the United States hasn't seen sustained and strategic nonviolent direct action for at least 45 years. And electoral majorities. The left. You can maybe argue has never seen electoral majorities, but definitely not, uh, let's say, since uh, the Reagan era, and particularly since 1994 when the Republicans took the House of Representatives for the first time in six or seven decades. Um, so, yeah, the, the, again, strategy under organizing, the recruitment and involvement of specific large numbers of people whose power is derived from their ability to withdraw their labor or other cooperation from those who rely on them. That doesn't mean your power comes from being morally correct. Your power doesn't come from being righteous. Your power doesn't come from being uh, the smartest one in the room. Your power doesn't come from getting in the streets and holding signs and honking horns and making noise. Power comes from your ability to withdraw your labor or other cooperation from those who rely on them. And what are we talking about? We're talking about majority strikes at the workplace. We're talking about sustained and strategic nonviolent direct action and electoral majorities all working together all at the same time. Framings, frames matter to some degree, but the numbers involved are sufficiently compelling to create a significant earned media strategy. Mobilizing under the organizing approach, under the strategy of organizing, Mobilizing is seen as simply a tactic, not a strategy. This is where so many people on the left go wrong. This was what I talked about in the left-wing Pokemon article replying to Chris Hedges, who, along with a whole number of anarcho people on the American left, see mobilizing as a strategy, uh, and they're fundamentally wrong. The people focus in the organizing approach, organic leaders. The base is expanded through developing the skills of organic leaders. What are organic leaders? Organic leaders are people who are the key influencers of a constituency. They're the people who can then, independent of staff, recruit new people who have never been involved, 
individual face-to-face -face interactions are key. The people focus under the organizing approach is not every single person. Every single special little snowflake in the world is not the focus <laughs> for the organizing approach. A lot of, now that's not to say that every single person isn't important. Uh, they are. The point that McAlevey is making is that strategists, organizers, people who have limited time, capacity, and uh, money, resources, can only spend their time on so many things at once. So when we are organizing, what are we looking for? We're looking for organic leaders. The base isn't going to be expanded by us talking to individually 10,000 people. The base is going to be expanded through developing the skills of these organic leaders who are the key influencers of their constituency. Now, I don't particularly like the word constituency, but the reason McAlevey is using it is because it could be in any context. So who would an organic leader be in your apartment complex? Let's say you live in an apartment complex where people have lived there for some time. You don't have a lot of turnover. Uh, people sort of see themselves as living in that space for the rest of their lives, or they at least, you know, see themselves as being a part of that space. They're not looking to, like, run away. In that context, you might have a tenant uh, in the complex that everyone knows. Hey, there's Jane. Oh, I'm sorry. Jane is the one who wrote the book. Um, there's Lindsay. Lindsay lives in the complex. She's lived here for 10 years. If anybody has a problem on her floor, they usually go to Lindsay. You know, or Lindsay is someone who people in the complex generally trust. Trust is a key thing. You know, who do people look to at their workplace? There's always someone. The left, I think, one of the problems we face, Mick, this is getting off track from what McAlevey is saying, but this is my adding my own two cents. One of the problems we have on the left is too much sentimentality. Uh, there's too much ideology and sentimentality and all of these like weird hangups about everybody's voice counting and everybody getting a say in this and everybody should be treated equally and that blah, blah, blah. My point would be that a lot of leftists have to drop that bullshit and they have to get serious about where they're going to spend their time. And that means, to me, focusing on the people in the community who can bring people along with them. And that's precisely what McAlevey is saying about organic leaders. Organic leaders are the sort of people who, you know, instead of going to 500 homes and knocking on doors, are there five people who can bring out 250 people? There probably are. You know, there are people in every community, in every workplace, in every church uh, who are more trusted uh, than others in that setting. And those are exactly the people we have to reach out to because if you get that person in the workplace, that's the usually a good worker, usually accountable, uh, on time, uh, usually actually even liked by the bosses and management. That's another dynamic uh, that we could speak to another time. But usually the those type of people are the organic leaders in the workplace and organic leaders do not have to agree with you. Now we're trying to bring them over to our side, and that's the job of the organizer to do that, to find strategic ways to bring that organic leader over to our side because once we have that organic leader, they're going to bring many people with them. But a lot of times, the people we'll identify as organic leaders might be initially hostile to our efforts. Well, this is where we get to the difference between organizing and mobilizing. In unions and social movement organizations in the United States today, advocacy, and especially mobilizing prevail. This is the main reason, again, to wrap up this section, why modern movements have not replicated the kinds of gains achieved by the earlier labor and civil rights movements. Hari Han has a somewhat similar chart in her excellent book, How Organizations Develop Activists. Check out that book as well. Make sure to also check out Jane McAlevey's book, No Shortcuts, but check out Han's book as well. Han, however, focuses on what McLevy calls self-selecting groups that do not make class a central issue. So this is another component to keep in mind. A lot of the advocates and mobilizers do not make class a central issue. Because if you do make class a central issue, where do you have to organize? You have to organize at the workplace. And that's something a lot of leftists feel uncomfortable doing. Why? Because it's difficult work where you have to talk to people who don't agree with you. And not just people who don't agree with you. You're going to be talking to a lot of people who are outright hostile to you. And because, in my opinion, this is not McLevy's words, these are my words, because we've developed a sort of really sissy left, uh, a sort of soft, easily offended, um, 
just, you know, it's a trash culture that's been created on the left. And it's created a lot of weak people who are pushovers, uh, who don't know how to deal with conflict and who, in fact, run from conflict. I would argue a lot of this comes from the new left uh, following 1968, but that's a conversation for another day. In McLevy's book, class is a central focus. And on the clear and vital distinction between the strategy of developing activists who are not always drawn from the working class and that of developing organic leaders who always are. So another problem with advocacy and organizing, not only do they not focus on class, whereas organizing does, but advocacy and mobilizing have a sort of, there's a clear and vital distinction between the strategy of developing activists, which is what advocacy and mobilizing does. It's developing activists. And then the difference between who are not always drawn from the working class. And in fact, in my experience, most of the full-time quote unquote activists I've met over the years uh, come from a sort of professional class, upper middle class background, highly educated, so on and so forth. Developing organic leaders in the context of organizing, they always come from the working class. That we don't, if you're interested in building power in your community, in your workplace, etc., you are not spending your time focused on people who are not in the working class. doesn't mean you don't ever work with people outside of the working class. It doesn't mean you might not team up on an event, do this, that, this thing, that thing, or the other thing. But your primary focus is building power among ordinary working class people. And in order to do that, you've got to identify the organic leaders and work on them. Okay. That's enough this time around. I will do another portion. I'm going to probably record it right now because these two are uh, intimately connected, but I wanted to make these around 30 to 40 minutes to keep them short enough to hopefully keep people's attention. So in the next section, we'll talk about self-selected groups versus structure-based organizing. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this Organizing 101 series. Much of this uh, second episode has been taken from Jane McAlevey's No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age. Check it out. Check out our work at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, Media. Thank you very much.